Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. It's a real pleasure and uh, honor to be here. And I am glad we are a small group, both here and online, because what I want to do today is something very philological. Uh, my question is simple, and it is the following. Uh, we have been studying increasingly the translations of medical text from uh, Arabic to Greek, from Greek to Arabic, from Arabic to Latin, or during the Renaissance. But in my opinion, I cannot believe that the transmission of knowledge around the Mediterranean was just a scholarly enterprise. I do believe that it started uh, in the field, people working together. And so this is the evolution of my own work. And what I have been really working on recently is how can we have some idea, can we catch this possible uh, collaboration between people of different languages and different cultures and different backgrounds? That's exactly the question I would like uh, to address today. And I've been working on that very recently. And so since I'll focus on the uh, southern Italy, Sicily, and the continent. I have taken here to get started this map of the uh, presence, increased presence of the Arabo-Islamic society in uh, Sicily and also uh, Italy. And so you'll see here, this map summarizes the occupation of Sicily between 827 and 965. And so the dates are relatively important in what I am trying to do today because I really want to limit the uh, time span between uh, possible Arabization and possible translation. I want really to narrow that and to see if we can understand and grasp when and where these people were uh, working together. And so uh, mostly we'll cover 250 years of history, but you'll see I'll try to be much more precise than that. Uh, and since I just spent one month uh, in uh, Salerno, no need to tell you that Salerno is considered to be the prototype of the cross-cultural exchanges in the field of medicine. And this uh, reality has been expressed by this tale, this legend of the encounter of four physicians, Salerno, a local one, Ponto, a Greek one, Elino, a Jew, uh, phys Jewish physician, and Adela, an uh, Arabic one. And so it appears uh, that this might be a post-factum legend fabricated in the 15th century, but it expresses the concept of what I would like to uh, work on. And so here, for, uh, to refresh the memory of everybody, the situation, the geographic and political military situation uh, in the southern part of Italy and Sicily toward the year 1000. And this will be very useful when we'll be in the last part of this talk because we'll follow somebody who crossed all these uh, areas. Before really getting into, I just want to summarize very briefly how I work on that, but uh, you probably all know that. Uh, we, Emmanuel and I, travel all over the world to discover manuscripts. Very often uh, we find manuscripts that haven't been open for quite a long time. And so you see here that we really see the manuscript. And so here, for example, the kind of manuscript we might uh, work on. This is a recent manuscript, the Atrosophic Tradition. But let's say the principle is the same. We work on the manuscript themselves. And I guess you know this uh, census. This is the one I was referring to yesterday, uh, Sosha, uh, which uh, summarized the work of 40 years of research for manuscripts. And so here, basically, I made two different things, uh, and I assembled these two things. First, I made a revision of the catalog of Greek medical manuscript by deals, and I checked all the indication of deals to be sure that they were correct, and many were not correct, sometimes because he used uh, ancient catalogs, 
and more recent catalogues, and he mentioned the same manuscript according to different catalogues with two different numbers. And so in the deals, we have uh, 1857 different quote, uh, call numbers of manuscripts, but in fact, we have 1350 different manuscripts. And so that's one thing I made here. But the other thing, I also made the inventory on the basis of my own research. And so I mixed these two approaches. And so this book can be used in two different ways. And with the manuscript which I have inventoried, we arrive to over 2,300 manuscripts, actually 2,349. So which means uh, 1,300, 2,300. Uh, I've almost doubled the number of uh, extant known manuscripts. More recently, I published these. In the first, this is based on the deals, strictly. And so in the first volume, which is on the left, I have reproduced all the content of deals, nothing else, which I have modernized the font, because I don't need to tell you the font in the deals is quite difficult to read. The quality of the paper in this uh, early 20th century edition is not that good, and sometimes the pages disappear under your fingers. And so here, I have made a new edition, if we want, of the deals. And in volume five, which is on the right, I have collected for each manuscript mentioned by deals, I've collected all the information in the deals. Because I remind you that in deals, we have the manuscript by authors and works. And so let's assume that we are talking about Parisinus 2183. There are uh, four different texts, Dioscorides, Pseudo-Dioscorides, Carme de Veribus Herbarum, and some anonymous material. So this manuscript appears in four different sections of the deal. And what I have done in volume uh, five, I have regrouped all the information about Parisinus 2183, for example. In volume two, three, four, I have collected volume two, all the information about all the manuscripts of Hippocratic text, volume uh, three, all Galenic texts, and volume four, all the uh, other author, but again, proceeding by manuscripts. And so in volume two, for example, if you take uh, Marcianus 277, you have all the texts in the Marcianus 277. So uh, the idea here was to republish deals, to sum up what you have in deals, and to lay down the basis of what will be in the future a new catalog of uh, Greek medical manuscripts. And so here, with this slide, what I wanted to do is summarizing how I do think that it's possible to combine codicology paleography, textual history, and history of the transmission of the text and the ideas. And so here, we have a stemma codicum, if we want, but more than codicum, stemma of translations of the Greek text of Dioscorides into Arabic. And so you'll see that we have three colors, which represent three geographic areas. And for each color, we have a box for the manuscript. So each box corresponds to a manuscript. We have also the phases of the translation for the blue translation. First, you have the Syriac, then we have a first Arabic translation, then a second Arabic translation. And you'll see that uh, the second Arabic translation, 9th century, and then for the next manuscript, 13th century, we have a stop, which is the conquest of Baghdad in 1055. And so I wanted to summarize here all the different translation and their phases, all the manuscript, but also the geographic area, the chronology, and the possible events which had an impact on the transmission of the text. And so that's the kind of approach I am using to move from paleography codicology to history of text, history of ideas, a tradition. And so this is the kind of approach I will uh, use in my presentation. And so here, I have uh, summarized the work we do. We always, Emera and myself, it's not a we of majesty. Uh, we dig a trench through the history 
all around the Mediterranean, going clockwise, sometimes counterclockwise, uh, from Greece to the 21st century, and I included the 21st century because there are some iatrosophic manuscripts in Greece which are uh, the early 20th century. And so we can follow the whole transmission of the text all around the Mediterranean through all uh, this uh, culture. <coughs> Before we start to see how the information was transmitted, there is a physical question that we need to face. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday have already seen that, so I apologize for the repetition, but not everybody was uh, with us uh, yesterday. Uh, in 1974, a Canadian uh, scholar, historian of uh, economy, suggested that the Arabic world created, generated, an agricultural revolution which has been called the Green Arabic Revolution or the Arabic Revolution. And so his idea was that when the Arabic Empire was at its zenith from India and beyond India, China to Andalusia, the Arabic Empire moved the plants throughout this empire, introducing around the Mediterranean plants from the Far East. That was the idea. And so you see here several publications and also the book in which he uh, explained that. The interpretation has been uh, very well received in the first phase and then it has been criticized. And you see here two of the most recent uh, criticism of the theory. And so there are two major problems. First, most of the plants that Watson claimed to have been introduced by the Arabs during the period that we have seen were already known in antiquity. And so the Arabs didn't really introduce them, they reintroduced them, which makes quite a difference. And second, the technique of irrigation, which according to Watson was created by the Arabs, was in fact the recovery, restoration, and improvement of the Roman system of irrigation. So uh, now we consider that this uh, green Arabic revolution, we need to nuance that theory. But nevertheless, there has been uh, the introduction of some uh, plants or reintroduction. And so here again, an image image that you have seen uh, yesterday. I show immediately what I do think is the source of this image. So on the left, we have clearly a river, and we have something that looks like trees. And on the right, we have the same plant, Malabatron, uh, cinnamon, on an Arabic manuscript, actually the most ancient copy of the Arabic translation of Dioscorides in Leiden, dated to 1081. And if we compare the two illustrations, we see that on the right, in the Arabic illustration, we have water and we have leaves, which have a typical form with an error in the center, which is really uh, marked and very clear. On the left, we have the water, the river, and we have the same shape of the leaves, with this difference between the two parts marked by the nervure in the center of the leaf. The difference is that the leaf, which is floating on the water in the Arabic manuscript, became a tree uh, in the uh, Greek image. And uh, even though this is a scientific mistake, it's very interesting because it tells us that the uh, Greek illustrator didn't know the plant in itself, but only the Materia Medica, which in this case is probably the drug, le the dry leaf that is a drug. And so here we have the same leaf in a uh, Latin manuscript, now in the British Library, probably dating to sometimes around 1340. So we see that there was indeed an influence of the Arabic world on the Mediterranean, but not necessarily a full uh, Arabic or green revolution. And so uh, to engage with the topic, we'll start with uh, Salerno as a, a crossing point. And so here you have this wonderful uh, picture of the Bay of Salerno. That's where we spent uh, one month, but it wasn't that nice because it rained a lot. We were hoping to have 
a nice day of sunny um, Salerno. It wasn't the case. I, I am returning to here the legend, the four physicians who met. And here I take a text which is very well known from uh, Richer de Reims, who died uh, after 998. And so we have it in the uh, edition of the Monu Monumenta Germaniae Historiae. I have reproduced the page where we have the text. And here uh, we have a study of this text by uh, Christeller. But uh, there, was, uh, there were other studies before that. I've taken that one specifically, which was published in uh, 1945 with an Italian translation in 1955. And here is a fragment which is of interest. And so we have a small story about a Sanitan physician, which is in France, the court of a king whose name is not provided explicitly. But the anecdote is reportedly taken place at the year of the death of the uh, Bishop de Roldus, so in 947, supposedly. And so we read the text together. So uh, de Roldus was a respectable uh, person, uh, a man at the court, so somebody who was navigating among these um, people, and extremely knowledgeable in medicine. And so here, every single word is important. The French bishop is extremely knowledgeable. On the other hand, there was a quodam sanenitano, a certain sanenitan guy. Uh, let's say I translate with guy to communicate the meaning of the quodam. So a sanenitan of uh, whom we don't know the name. And so the sanenitan clearly didn't have any scientific background. He was ignorant. But nevertheless, he had in rebus experientiam. He had an experience. He was a practitioner. And this is supposedly why it was called there at the court of the king uh, in France. And this was supposedly the fame of Salerno. And uh, much of the literature about the origin of Salerno is based on that, these physicians were practitioners who knew the thing. And then continuing the text, and I have omitted all the details because there is a small story here, uh, which is very interesting, this uh, phrase now, the Sanenitan anonymous guy uh, didn't notice the uh, names, uh, foreign, uh, the exogen names of the plant, and he evited, avoided to reply uh, on the questions about that. And this is where I do think that the sting of the scorpion is, because Salerno had the fame to be a cross-cultural place. And so this guy with experience didn't know the names of the plants in other languages. And I do think that here there is really in Coda Venenum, uh, we have really uh, the willingness to attack where they knew it would hurt. And so these physicians who had no scientific background but were practitioners were really ignorant. He did not even know the name of the plants in other languages. So that's really a way of negating the fame of the school of Salerno at that time. So here we have a sign that there is this idea of cross-culturality supposedly sometimes around 947, but it might not be the case. We have to bear in mind also the uh, death of uh, Richer de Reims. And so we have to pursue an investigation to find something more solid. And so I moved to Sicily in the 12th century, and we have the uh, translation, the Greek translation of the Zad al-Musafir of Ibn al-Jazar. Uh, which has been translated into Latin by Constantine the African, uh, the Viaticum Peregrinantium in Greek, Ephodia to Apodemontos. It's a very famous text among the Byzantinists. And so uh, you 
see here a part of the list of the manuscript. There are many manuscripts of it. I have just taken a part. And so here I see that the computer doesn't like my Greek alphabet. I hope it won't be a problem because uh, we should have an Omega uh, 72. I do hope that for the citations later on, uh, it will be Greek and not this kind of onomopatea. And so the most ancient manuscript is the Vaticanus Graecus 300, of which uh, we see a page here. And uh, he, one of his hands is similar to one of the hands of the Skelices of Madrid, of which you see an image there. And a paleographer and codicologist have uh, considered that this is a manuscript dating back to 1130, 1140, Messina or Palermo. And I would like to study a little bit uh, closer the text here. I have put together some of the uh, references of the studies about this manuscript, which has been quite well uh, studied. And here, an important study, which is the one which clarified the question of the hand of the manuscript by uh, Nigel Wilson. And we will uh, return to uh, that. And so this manuscript is famous, among other, the Greek works. Uh, <laughs> uh, but let's say, let's wait. Uh, the manuscript is famous because there are uh, fragments by a certain Philippos Xeros, in which this Philippos Xeros talks of himself as the first person. And so that's why you've said ego. And so here we have one of these fragments. And yes, we have the Greek. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you can breathe, uh, third time. Uh, so you see here, ego ge otapenos Philippos otoniatron elachistos, hypoxenon polon prosopon, kai philon gneson, kai adelphon. Uh, myself, a small and modest humble physician, I have been asked by uh, several uh, foreign uh, uh, physician important people, uh, people who were knowledgeable and uh, who were brothers but uh, companions. So he talks about himself as if this manuscript were of himself, but uh, this uh, ego, and so here, uh, sorry, uh, we have indeed in a manuscript a uh, book of uh, formulae uh, for medicine which have been collected by Philippos Xeros. So there is some probability, there is some consistency in considering that he is a physician. But the question is, does he really uh, he is the owner of the manuscript. And so here, Nigel Wilson, as early as 1978, has raised the question of whether this ego refers to the owner of the manuscript or not. And so you'll see here that Nigel Wilson uh, hypothesized or raised the question of whether this manuscript, this ego, might not have been the owner of the manuscript. And so what I have done, having reproduced the text, I have analyzed it with my magnifier, and um, I have checked some anomalies. And so you'll see here, for example, first line, uh, Dioscorides says that the leaves of uh, sesame, and you have the parenthesis, which is semsem. And then the text continues. Second uh, example, uh, Dioscorides says that uh, wheat of the plant Gubeiris, and we don't have a Greek name for that. Continuing, we have the same thing, uh, Dioscorides, there is a text in the margin, and we have the um, plant there, which is Tsufaras, and according to other people, is Kufrale. So uh, we see already not only that there are Arabic terms, but also variants on these Arabic terms, which we have here. And then uh, in the last example I have on this slide, uh, the basilicon, which is called El Bedorud. So we have what I do believe work on this uh, text. And what I want to do is trying to understand how the work on that text went on, how it was processed. And so here we have something very clear, which I call equivalence of different calendars. And so uh, Ganon says that uh, if the god starts up from the month of Nisan, and then you have uh, a parenthesis, Nisan, which is uh, April. So here we have somebody who wrote Nisan, and we don't know whether this is a translator uh, 
arabophone or the writer alenophone who used the term Nissan because it reproduced it. We don't know, but there is something, somebody who had it, Nissan, which is April. And so continuing, we have here in the formulae for medicine, names of plants in Arabic. We've already seen that in my first slide. And so uh, since I have digitized the whole text of the uh, Ephodia, I can find the number, number of occurrences. And so you see that this uh, Dexenae, we have 12 occurrences, and Mukol, we have one occurrence of that. Continuing here, we have double plant names. We have uh, here the first one, Sikipinets, and then the Delon Glocon, OST Mukul, Azrak. And so the OST, I do believe that this is an addition. We have already seen a toy, uh, or which is, and things like that. So here we have something which is an intervention of the text. But in the second example, uh, same, same sort of thing. The uh, African uh, species, which is called Wetaya, and the Kokimela Zarur. So we have this constant play between the two languages. And this is exactly what I am interested in. And here, we have a really interesting passage. And I have reproduced in the lower part of my slide the English translation. And so you'll see that the English translation, the text, the Arabic text is quite simple. They used to call this plant Agnos because this word is the language of the Syriac speakers in Syria derived from the notion of chastity. That's a very simple etymological explanation. In the Greek text instead, we have exactly the translation of that, which is the first two lines of my slide. And then, in yellow, you have an explanation. To testitodendron to Abraham o catharos, o te catharos esti can agnon, kai synergei process agenian. And here, again, the explanation. Etoi to me parorman pros lagenian o cathedon. And so we discover here the reference to the biblical text, but also the explanation of the therapeutic, supposedly uh, therapeutic properties of the plant as an anticonceptional. And of course, you discover that it's not a real anticonceptional, but it's an anaphrodisiac, according to this text. But so what is interesting here is that we have this explanation with the reference to the biblical text and some sort of medical explanation uh, an aphrodisiac. And here we have what I do think is the most interesting cases of these interventions on the text. Here there is uh, the reference to the aloe from the island of Socotra. And between parentheses, this is a region which is called that way. So that's a geographical explanation. And then what I do believe is the most interesting passage, we have here, something about the alum from Yemen, which is the part in uh, white, and then you have the part in yellow. If you read it that way, you can understand it, but you really have to, say, uh, to stop one moment and to think about it. And so uh, we will not read it because look what I have done. I've taken this fragment of text and I have cut it in fragments. And you'll see that it creates a very interesting effect. The first element, Yemen, Chora Uto Karumene. So just as we had for Socotra. And then we have an explanation of that. So on the first geographical explanation, we have a second geographical explanation to make it more precise, to more, more, more uh, clearer. And then on that, on the name Mefirke, we have an Enistide Sideropolis. So we have an explanation of the explanation. And we continue uh, with this kind of analysis segment by segment. And we discover that Sideropolis is 10 days from Babylonus. And again, we have an explanation on that Babylon, which is Baghdad. And finally, we have a final notice about that, which is the city where uh, Johannes Damascenus was born. So what I want to do here is 
suggesting that this text here is a summary, all packed together, of a series of levels of interventions, which were cumulative. And so there were explanation of explanations. And so this is how I represented that here as a scale. What I want to do is suggesting that we have here different levels of information, different, different generations of people who intervened in that text. I don't think that this is not by one and the same person. In my opinion, there are more people who intervene in that text in succession. That's exactly my point here. And so what I do think is that we have to go back in time. We started from the manuscript Vaticanus Graecus uh, 300, which is dated because of paleography and codicology, to 1, uh, 1130, 1140. I do think that we have several layers of interventions, and we can go down the most up to 979, the death of Ibn al-Jazar. And so what I really want to do is trying to catch this cross-cultural work between the people, uh, Greek and uh, Arabic. And so I continue my investigation, and uh, here is why I've introduced, to get started, the question of method, my search for manuscripts. And here we have a manuscript which, when you see the content, you would not guess that it might have Arabic, Persian, or whatever content. Uh, and here, in this manuscript, and so the date, uh, late 10th century, that's important. Uh, we see here that we have a fragment which is not Greek. When we cut the page, we see that it's clearly Greek alphabet, but if we try to read it, we cannot read it as Greek. And there has been a study which has been published about that, Barbara Zipser in 2004, she brought this text to the attention of the scholarly community. She transcribed it. She was able to identify a certain number of terms, and it appears that it is a formula for a medicine, which is, in fact, mostly in Arabic, but written in Greek. And so here, we really come to the core of the question. Uh, Hellenophon and Arabophon people probably working together, and we don't know who does what at this point of time. But we clearly see an interaction between the two worlds, exchanging even the alphabet to write their own uh, language. And so here in the same manuscript, we do have some uh, annotations in Arabic and in Arabic alphabet. So we, we begin to understand better what this is about. And here, another manuscript, uh, which I came across more recently, uh, two years ago, uh, from southern Italy, possibly dating, dated to 980. And so you see the content. And here again, you cannot guess from this kind of catalographic description that there is uh, Arabic or heterogeneous material. But when you read the text, you find indeed the kind of uh, terms which I have written on the right side of the uh, page, which are clearly not Greek, but written in Greek alphabet. And so uh, we have uh, on folio 36 recto, uh, sakhar, sugar. We are not surprised by that. Uh, but uh, I presented this slide very recently during my month in uh, Salerno, and somebody told me that some of the names which I have shown might not be just Arabic, but also Albanian. And there still is, in uh, Calabria, in Italy, a strong Albanian community. So here we might have the sign of uh, Albanian uh, presence here, and uh, exchanges of plant names among these communities. And so here we have a formula, El Buchtikon, the explanation, Oesti Apozema, Siristi. And Apozema is boiling a plant 
to get an infusion. So that's a technical term. So we have the explanation of the Arabic term. And Suristi, in the manuscript in which we have Arabic material, the Arabs are never identify as uh, Arabs, but as Syrian, Saracens, or things like that. So we are not surprised about that. We don't believe that this is really a reference to the Syrians. And so we have continuing El Buktike, Seristi, Turbit, Ham, Enil, etc. We have uh, several elements in um, um, Arabic terms in Greek alphabet. And so here again, and here we have uh, in the center of my slide, uh, Moscow, which is a fabulous term, because Moscow is not the veil, the Moscos, but is the musk, M-U-S-K, which is the product of an animal which originally is from the Himalaya, which was used and still is used for perfume, for example, it's a fixative for uh, a perfume, and the name in Arabic is musk, uh, M-U-S-K, if we want. And so the term has been introduced into Greek and transformed into a morphologically correct Greek name by adding the dissonance Omicron Sigma. And so we have Moscos, but by coincidence, it corresponds to the name of the wheel. It's not the wheel. And so let's say the appearance of the animal might be of some sort of wheel, but it's not really. It's more a uh, ram than uh, a real wheel. And so here again, we have Zadwar, which is the Z-O-R of the uh, history of uh, pharmacy later on in uh, history. And we have uh, fat of elephants. So we have some sort of exotic materia medica. And so here I have uh, made some sort of list of the products that we have in that way uh, in uh, Greek alphabet, but uh, with the Arabic names or others. I put them in alphabetical order. We have also here some uh, other products which are clearly identified as exotic. And we have something which I'm still uh, wondering what it is about. Um, that's my regional phonetic. So Zmeg Mata with a Z, this is not correct, it's Smeg with a Sigma. And Kathmia, that's not correct, it's Kadmia with a Delta and not a theta. And so I am wondering whether this is not a regional a phonetic, and so we should take a look at that with specialists of the phonetic uh, in Sicily, Southern Italy. And so I have been focusing uh, on uh, names apparently Arabic, but we have also here, for example, a reference to uh, Julianus Pigmentarius, and a Pigmentarius is not somebody who sells pigments, but it's a pharmacist, a druggist uh, in the technical meaning of the word, somebody who sells drugs which are medicinal uh, products. And so if we make uh, one step back and we see the constitution of the text in that manuscript, we see that this is very classical. Uh, this uh, looks like a text that we have in other manuscripts. And so here I have made a brief inventory of the text. And so you can uh, see that there is nothing which is really strange or different. But we have, according to the titles, the identification of a certain number of people. Uh, Esdras, uh, that's a name which is very frequent in the manuscript. Uh, Logadios. Uh, we have the uh, patriarch of Constantinople, we have a uh, sophist Antonios and uh, Andronios or Theopompos from Byzantium. So this is very uh, Greek, but we have this infestation, if I may, of terms which are not uh, Greek at all. And so here, I do think that we begin to grasp very concretely people with different languages, different alphabets working together. We don't know who was a translator, if it's an Arabophone who translated into Greek or an Hellenophone who translated with a solid uh, knowledge of Arabic. And in that case, we might think that there was some sort of lingua franca 
in which the terms for the plants were not necessarily either Greek or Arabic, but they could move from one uh, language to the other. And so I do believe that there was a language which was common language shared, which was made of bits and pieces taken from one culture or the other. And so my point is that these people understood each other. They did not need translation. And so I do think that what we see here is something that metaphysically goes beyond the translation. Translation is not necessary here. We have a natural understanding of these people because these people have frequented each other. And they didn't need to sit down and to think of translating the text. There was a natural understanding of each other. And so I want to see if this kind of interpretation might be correct. And so here I came across the life of uh, Nelos of uh, Rosano. And so being uh, in Salerno, that was absolutely uh, appropriate. And so here I have taken from the edition uh, of uh, the life of uh, San Nelos some uh, significant element. And so uh, we know very well that uh, he was interested in uh, books, in producing copies of books, that he created uh, here this very nice uh, graphic uh, of uh, Greek, uh, which gave the name to the uh, Nilian uh, minuscule. And so here uh, you see this evaluation of his influence. The school of San Nilo worked from the second half of the 10th century until at least the first 30 years of the 11th century in a sort of itinerant scriptorium which moved from the Calabro Lucana region up to Campania, Salerno, Monte Cassino, Valle Luce, up to a rich uh, Latium. So it really went from Rosano to Tusculum, where uh, Nil uh, died. In this uh, codecological paleographical research, I came across here an interesting publication, uh, the references of which will come in one second. Uh, you see here a book in the Vatican uh, collection, a printed book, the binding of which is broken. And you see that when you open the book, you have in the uh, spine some pieces, fragments of manuscripts. And so here you have a clearer picture of that. And so we know that perfectly uh, when people were binding the books. They were filling in the spine to have it well round with pieces of paper, uh, whatever the paper uh, were. And here is the uh, study which brought this uh, manuscript to the attention already in 2008. And um, here you have the reconstruction of the page knowing the uh, tradition of the writing and the layout of the pages of the Nil Yan manuscript. And so this manuscript was probably produced sometimes around 990, 1010 in uh, Campania uh, from a Calabria writer used to write in uh, the minuscule typical of uh, Nelos. Uh, what is important is that this is a selection of uh, paragraphs, uh, passages from Dioscorides, Paul of Iena, uh, which have been uh, remade. And so I return to the life of uh, St. Uh, Nelos to see some interesting facts for us. Here I have summarized very briefly his nomadic life from uh, Calabria. Uh, we don't need to read all the details. What is important is to know that he crossed all the regions, and so you remember that among my very slides, there was a slide of the political organization of this part of Italy around the year uh, 1000. He crossed all the uh, region. He stopped 15 years in the vicinity of Monte Cassino, and he ended up in uh, Tusculum, uh, close uh, to Rome. And here, I have made a selection of the most significant passages which show that he really was in contact with the different cultures in the area. And so you have for uh, each one the number of the chapter, and I have summarized the content of the passage. And so you'll see that in chapter 29 there was a Saracen 
and again, that's the Arabs, which are uh, identified in different ways. An invasion, a uh, second passage, there is a, a very uh, interesting short story. A Jew was um, attacked by a young Greek uh, fellow, and the father of this young fellow was uh, taken in custody by the Jewish community, and St. Nilos intervened to the judges to avoid that the father of this young fellow would be condemned to death. And so uh, the action of St. Nilos allowed for uh, freeing this uh, old man, the father of the young fellow. Uh, again, chapter 36, periodic attacks of the Saracens, and chapter 53, uh, again, a small piece, a small narrative, uh, judge from Constantinople, Apraxios, was sent by the emperor, uh, the judge for Italy and Calabria, and Nilos did not meet him to adulate him, as did all the other people. So he really took his distance from the uh, official power. And so here, another uh, very interesting uh, passage. There was an invasion by the Agarans, the Arabs, of course, in Calabria. Three monks were taken in custody and transferred to Sicily by the Arabs. And Nil wrote to the secretary of the Emir, and surprisingly enough, Nilos received a reply from the Emir inviting him to go to Sicily and to be protected on the land of this Emir, and not only protected, but also honored and respected. And so here, apart from the political aspect of the story, we have also a religious uh, component of that story of uh, trans religious communities, real mutual uh, respect. And here, the last passage which I selected at the Casino Monastery, uh, Nailo celebrated the liturgy, and then the most monks uh, asked him many questions. They were around him uh, asking questions, and uh, Nailo's replied in Romaiki. So uh, he was able to speak different uh, languages. And here, a last passage, which is also extremely interesting. Uh, Nilos was in the Castro, and a Jew called Domnulos, the name is important, went to him, and Nilos knew him because this fellow was, he knew him from childhood, this is important. Uh, he knew him because he was a famous lawyer and very knowledgeable in medicine, and this Jewish fellow uh, was wondering how come Nilos didn't suffer of epilepsy because of the hard regimen of life he imposed to himself. And in order to compensate for this uh, strict regimen of life, this uh, Domnulos uh, offered uh, Nilos to prescribe medicine adapted to him, which would allow him to avoid disease for the rest of his life, and Nilos declined, of course. And we have this Domnulos coming again uh, in another chapter, and the fact is that Domnulos, in fact, is Shabeta in Ben Abraham Donnolo, and you have the dates here, a Jewish physician who is very famous because he's the author of an antidotarium of which we see a page there. So Nil had really intercultural contacts, he frequented, these communities interacted with these communities, and these contacts included some medicinal exchanges, even though at the same time, people writing in Nilian calligraphy reproduced the uh, classical text we have seen, uh, Dioscorides and Aetios. And I want to go a little bit beyond, but here I am opening new perspectives, which I haven't explored. Uh, in the manuscript of Florence 75.3, we have the text of Metrodora. And there is some similarity between the text of Metrodora and the text of Trotula, who is believed to be the women physician of uh, Salerno. And uh, she is considered to be an innovator who transformed medicine. I'm wondering whether the Trotula text might not be an adaptation of the Metrodora text. And in the same manuscript, we have another text which presents 
resemblances with the Antidotarium Magnum, which is a very typical Salernitan text, and the text which uh, present the similarities to that is the Antidotarium of Nicolaou Mirepsu. This is for uh, Ilias, uh, Ilias Valiakos, who published this text very recently in a massive and impressive erudite uh, edition. And so uh, here, I am wondering about this Antidotarion and the text of the Florentine Manuscript 75.3, uh, if we shouldn't uh, change our interpretation, because uh, the literature noticed the similarity between the Antidotarium and Nicolaus Mirepsos, and it was believed that Nicolaus Mirepsos might be a Greek translation of the Antidotarium. I am wondering whether we shouldn't uh, change the interpretation and consider that the two texts are, in fact, adaptations of the text in the 75.3. But I see Ilias, and I am sure that he will ask some uh, question. So let's conclude, because time is passing. So what I have been trying to do is to see if we can capture, in a very concrete way, the way uh, Arabophone people, Hellenophone people worked whether they work together, who translated, who corrected. I still don't know exactly who were the translator, who were the corrector, but I do think that we can see very concretely that these people work together. And here, I have tried to narrow the time period in which we can see the beginning of this cross-cultural action. And so I have taken uh, some uh, dates as uh, References, we have 979, the death of Ibn al-Jazar, supposing that the text was translated after his death. We have 19, 975, 1000, the two Greek manuscripts which I have discussed. We have 1004, the death of St. Nailos. 1076, the conquest of Salerno and uh, 85, the death of Alfanus. And so here we have something which might be very specific for Salerno, a time of political stability and prosperity with also a great intellectual as Alfanus and very close to that uh, time period with the death of Constantine the African. So I do believe that we have here uh, 1,000 year, 100 years, sorry, which, in which we see the interaction and then the development to more systematic things, which are, on the one hand, the school of Salerno, and on the other hand, the uh, activity of Constantine the African. And I do believe that this image here summarizes what I am trying uh, to uh, capture, which is the birth of this uh, cross-cultural uh, transfer of knowledge. So thank you very much for your uh, attention.